as we get started today. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, thank you that we can, no matter what condition we find ourselves in, in our spiritual life, Lord, uh, God, you can give us the revival that we need to keep going. And Father, we just want to lift up uh, our church, Lord, those who are hurting, those who are going through physical difficulties uh, at this time, Lord. We want to continue to pray for uh, Gracie and Lord, just ask for your hand of healing uh, to come upon her, Lord. We, we ask that uh, you would, uh, Lord, take this, uh, this, this pain from her that she's been dealing with uh, for so long. And God, we pray that you would remove it from her. And Lord, that you would completely heal her. And Father, we want to pray for Trish as well. And just pray that you would help to heal her from the pneumonia that she's been dealing with and just the after effects. And so God, we, uh, we, we pr pray that your hand of blessing would be on Trish as well. And Father, we ask that you would touch our hearts and minds today as we consider uh, the things that you tell us in your word. Uh, Holy Spirit of God, that you would lead us to a place of conviction, and yet that you would empower us to make the changes that need to be made in our lives. God, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began looking at the doctrine of the security of the believer. And we said that the Father and the Son and the Spirit of God all had a part as it pertains to the believer's salvation and securing that salvation. We said uh, last week, looking at the book of 1 John, that uh, uh, he actually talks about in that book, he said, these things were written so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so we said that God the Father wants us to know that we have eternal life. Amen? God does not want us to walk around wondering from one day to the next whether we're an orphan or whether we belong to Him. God wants us to know, indeed, that we belong to Him if we put our trust and faith in Christ. Then we said that the Son has promised that if we believe on Him, that we would never perish, that no one will pluck us from the hand of Jesus and then Jesus said, my father's greater than all, and no one can pluck you out of my father's hand. And so if we put our trust and faith in Christ, Jesus says, you're in my hand. And then he says, not only that, but he says, you're in the father's hand as well, and no one can take you out. We're going to talk about that just in just a moment here. And then we said that the purpose of the spirit is to seal us until the day of redemption. So when a person puts their trust and faith in Christ, the Bible says that they are sealed by the Holy Spirit, listen, until the day of redemption. And so, as believers in Jesus Christ, once the Holy Spirit puts that seal on us, then that is a mark that we belong to God as His adopted children. And really, we talked about the idea that that, that Holy Spirit, when God gives the Holy Spirit, He gives the thought of an engagement ring. It gives the thought of a down payment that God is giving to us as his adopted children. And then one day when we get to be with him in heaven, as heirs of God, we will receive our full inheritance. Amen? So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all involved in our security, involving our salvation. Now this morning, I want to follow up on this doctrine of security by tackling some of the thoughts as to why some Christians believe that you can lose your salvation. And I want to be very clear with this because, again, you may have come from a faith background that you know, taught that it was possible for a person to lose their salvation. Now, I've talked to different people from different faith backgrounds before and, uh, and, and those who do believe that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I haven't always been able to get a very clear answer as to what a person would have to do to lose their salvation, you know. Uh, you know, some might say it is by the way that a person lives their life. And, you know, if you, uh, you know, sin to a certain degree or a certain number of times or uh, you turn your back on the Lord, uh, then at some point God will remove 
his salvation from you. And so I've, I've heard people say that. I've also heard people say, well, it's not a matter of whether someone else could pluck you uh, out of God's hand, but, but you, can, you can certainly, because you have free will, you know, you can kind of get out of it yourself. You know, you could decide one day, well, I, I, you know, I, I'm just not for this salvation thing anymore. I, I guess I just would rather go to hell, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to decide that I don't want to be saved anymore. And, and there are actually some, some folks who uh, believe that you can take yourself out of the hand of God. We don't save ourselves, and we're not responsible for keeping our salvation as well. That is all of God. And so the first thought that we're going to consider this morning is this thought, and that is the process of salvation. The process of salvation. And by the way, let me just say this as well as it pertains to those who maybe believe that you could lose their salvation what what I really do enjoy about those folks is they really do strive to live a holy life. And so that is very admirable, okay? That is very admirable that someone would strive to live a holy life. Uh, you know, the only issue is they shouldn't be striving to live that holy life because they're afraid God will take their salvation away or that they somehow have to work to keep it. But they, they and we as well should be living a holy life because we love our Lord. Amen. And we're so thankful for what Jesus did for us on the cross and that God the Father was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son for our salvation. And so we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9, and then we're going to look at verses 18 through 23 of Matthew chapter 13 as we consider this idea of the process of salvation. So on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But uh, when the sun was up and they were scorched, because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear." And so the Lord is talking about really, you know, when, when, he, when he talks about the, the seed, he's talking about the Word of God. And, and when he talks about, you know, these, these different conditions of the soil, he's talking about the heart of individuals. And so, you know, we all have different hearts. We all have hearts that are, are, are in different states as to whether they are able and willing to receive the Word of God or not. And so let's look at the, the answer to the parable that Christ gave, going down to verse 18. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and, uh, or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And so, again, when we look at this parable of the sower, we see individuals that have different reactions to 
the word of God based on the condition of their hearts. And, and I believe that it's obvious by looking at these different heart conditions that the, the person who uh, was truly saved was the individual uh, who heard the word and they had that, that, that good soil, that, that heart that was ready to receive the word of God. The person with the wayside heart heard the word of the, or heard the word. It says, but the enemy snatched it away, so that it was forgotten. Now you might say, well, how does the enemy do that? Uh, I don't know exactly how the enemy does all of that. I, I will say that the devil is very good at lying. He's the father of lies. He's very good at distraction and uh, taking people's minds away from. Uh, what they should be thinking about. So perhaps that is how he does it, but that is the person with the wayside heart. The person with the stony heart receives the word for a time with joy, but when persecution comes, they wither away. The person with the heart of thorns is in love with the world and the things of this world, so the word gets choked out and the world is chosen over the word of God. The person with the good heart is able to receive the word. It takes root in their lives, and according to the Bible here, it bears much fruit. And so clearly this is the Christian, the person whose life is bearing fruit. And this parable explains a lot because many of us know different individuals. We've come across people that would fall into each of these categories. Maybe you know someone who walked an aisle at one point, and maybe they had tears streaming down their cheeks, and, and they came faithfully to church for a while, but then there came a time where, you know, they stopped coming, and, and, and maybe you said to yourself, well, I don't understand. Man, they seem to be so excited for God, and, and, and now for some reason they're not coming uh, anymore, and we, and we don't exactly know why. Or, or maybe uh, you've seen someone that you know, came for a short time, and, and maybe they were interested a little bit, uh, but then they returned to the world and the things that the world had to offer them, and ultimately they chose the world over uh, Jesus Christ. Maybe you know people who have that wayside heart that would say, you know, maybe they showed a, a little bit of interest, but, but, but not very much, and then now they're just completely uninterested uh, at all. And so, you know, we know different people like this who are in different places. And, and, and here's what I would say about that. Be, because just because someone is in a different place as far as their heart condition, that doesn't mean they can't change, right? You could have someone come who has a wayside heart or someone who has that heart of stone or someone who has that, that heart of thorns and they're not as receptive to the Word. Uh, their life is not producing fruit the way that it should. But hey, listen, you keep encouraging them to come. You keep encouraging them to read their Bible. You keep encouraging them to pray because God can work in people's lives and, and one day their lives can produce fruit. One day they can truly be saved if they're willing to accept the Lord into their heart and life. Don't give up on people. I guess that's the best way to say it. Don't give up. Even if they did come for a while and then they stopped coming and, and you say, well, I did my part. You know, I can't help it if they gave up on God. Uh, listen, yes, you can. You, you keep at it. You keep challenging them. You keep inviting them. You keep on trying. You do the best that you possibly can and let God take care of the rest. So for some people, salvation happens immediately because their hearts are ready to receive the message of the gospel. But for others, it may take a little bit longer because their hearts are not ready yet. The biggest problem, I would say, is with those who have what, 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 what the Bible calls this, this stony heart condition, where it says that, they react, and they go along for some time, but then it says that when persecution comes, when, when trials come into their lives, they wither away. 
because the decision was not a real decision. It was just an emotional decision that was made. And, and, and listen, that's important for us to understand because, you know, we're going to have people like that who could actually sit in church and, and, and they could respond in an emotional way and they could get to build friendships in the church. And, and, and see, here's the problem, you know, because you guys are so nice, right, that, that it's possible that people could come and they could just, you know, enjoy the fellowship and enjoy the friendship that is there. But then, you know, they, they really haven't made a true decision for Jesus. And, and, and listen, that's a dangerous place to be. And that's not a place that you want to be. And one of the reasons that is true, and especially in this country, is because in, in the United States, you don't normally see any type of real persecution against the Christian church. You say, oh, but pastor, you know, I, I see where they're trying to make it, where if you, you say something, you know, in, in a church, uh, it would be hate speech. Or, or I've seen before where, you know, like during COVID, where they were trying to cause the churches to lock their doors and, and things like that. And yes, I'm not going to say that those things haven't happened, but I'm just simply saying, uh, and I'm just guessing, I don't know that there's anybody in here today who's ever been beaten, uh, who has ever been tortured, uh, or who has lost their life for their faith. We just don't have to face that in this country at this time the way that other believers in other parts of the world do. And so if you have somebody who is a believer in another part of the world and they're told, you know, deny Christ or you're going to lose a limb. Deny Christ or you're going to be tortured. Deny Christ or uh, you're going to lose your life. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a major choice that they're having to make with regards to their faith. And we don't have that. So we don't have those, those testing times to that degree. I'm not saying we're not tested, but I'm talking about we're not tested to that degree. And so because we're not tested to that degree, it is possible, listen, it is possible that we can even fool ourselves if we're not careful. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? What's he saying? Paul is saying that just the same way that it is it is good and it's prudent for us to go to the doctor maybe once a year and get a checkup. You know, you say, well, I, I don't feel like there's anything wrong with me. Well, maybe there is nothing wrong, but it's still a good idea to go and get a checkup and just have uh, the doctor let you know for sure that, hey, you're, you're good to go. Everything is fine. Paul says here that as Christians, there needs to be times in our life, and I don't believe all the time, I don't believe it's every day, but from time to time, we need to examine our lives. We need to be willing to make sure that we are in the faith. We need to be willing to ask questions like, do I see the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Do I see God working in my life? Has, has my life changed ever since I became a Christian? Which leads us to a, a final thought or a second thought today, and that is this. And that is the evidence of perseverance. The evidence of perseverance. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts chapter 14. And we're going to look at that in just a moment here. Acts chapter 14. Let me just go ahead and read that now. Acts 14 verses 21 and 22. The Bible says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Look at this. Exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Well, why did they have to exhort them to continue in the faith? 
Well, probably because they were going through trials and tribulations that were, were tempting them to walk away from faith. And Paul said, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And so when we examine our lives, there should be multiple evidences, not just maybe one, but multiple evidences of our faith in Christ. Jesus said that people would know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. Let me ask you a question this morning. Since you've become a Christian, is your love for others more evident? Is your love for the brethren, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, more evident? Have you grown in your love for others? That's a great question to ask as you're doing that self-examination of your faith. Is there evidence of the fruit of the Spirit? Is there an ever-growing surrender to the Lordship of Christ? And Jesus should be our Lord even more now than when we first became a Christian. When we first became a Christian, we didn't understand everything about the Lordship of Christ. But as we grow in our faith, that, then we should understand the Lordship of Christ in a greater way, and we should be submitting ourselves in a greater way. There should be a love for the Word of God. Do you, do you enjoy reading your Bible? Do you enjoy praying to the, word, uh, to the Lord? As believers, we should be given to good works, the Bible says. We should be given to good works. And there's another evidence that for us to, to consider, and that is the evidence of our perseverance. The evidence of our perseverance. Now, in the book of James, we learned that faith without works is dead, right? You read that before? Faith without works is dead. Well, it's not, it's not saying that we're saved by our works. What it's saying is that if you say that you have faith, but there's no works to back it up, there's no evidence, then you can't really say that you're truly a Christian because good works is an evidence of your saving faith. Well, that's the way perseverance is. Perseverance doesn't save you, but if you persevere in your faith, that is an evidence that you have genuine faith. Amen? That's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. And so, uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as they per persevere in their Christian life, especially through difficult times, it does not cause them to be a Christian, it confirms that they already are one. Amen? How many of you have seen people in this church go through difficult times, and yet they're still here? They're still here. And you look at what they've gone through, and you say, that would, that would crush a normal person. A, a person who, who has gone through that, uh, humanly speaking, they would have every right to turn their back on God because they, they, they trusted in God and then this particular thing happened. And humanly speaking, uh, because God allowed that to happen, I wouldn't be surprised if that person stopped coming to church for a while. I wouldn't, stop, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that person stopped praying. I wouldn't be surprised if that person stopped reading their Bible. Because they were upset with the Lord. I got to tell you, Jack, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. The Sunday after his wife passed, you know where Jack was? Right there. And I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, if, if, man, if he wanted to just kind of take a week and, it, you know, Sunday and just be at home and, and, you know, I mean, his wife just passed and, you know, he's mourning, and, but Jack was right there. And, and, and that's all I'm saying. You know, when you go through difficult times in your life, you know, typically people, they run to God or they run from God. And, and when you have that genuine faith in the Lord, then usually 
when, when things start to, to go crazy in your life, when, when things start to blow up and, and you don't know what's going to happen next, then you will run to God and not from him. In Acts 14, 21 through 22, we see the Apostle Paul returning to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch to encourage the believers there and to remind them that when you stand for Christ, listen, there are going to be tribulations. Matter of fact, it's interesting if you uh, read earlier in uh, Acts chapter 14, Paul was stoned and left for dead. I mean, imagine, uh, I mean, it must have been pretty bad for if, if they thought that he was actually dead and they left him for dead. It must have been bad. And yet here is Paul. He was stoned for his faith and for preaching the gospel. And yet here he is coming back around again and teaching and preaching and exhorting and encouraging all over again. It's worth it. It's worth it. Keep on going. It's worth it, whatever you're going through. So if anyone tries to tell you that the Christian life is easy, it's not. And listen, we don't have to earn our salvation, and we don't have to keep our salvation, but we need to understand that God does allow us to go through difficult times to test our faith. And by the way, understand this, when God gives a test, the test isn't for him, right? God already knows where we are. God already knows whether we have genuine faith or not. The test isn't for God. The test is for us to see where we are, right? Remember Peter? Oh, Jesus, I'll die for you. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, man, I'd never do that, right? Right? So when Peter did it, was it Jesus who needed to know where Peter was, or was it Peter who needed to know where Peter was? It was Peter. And Peter was faced with that stark reality that, oh my goodness, it just everything just happened the way that Jesus said it was going to happen. And I said that I would be willing to die for him. And look at where I am now. And he went away sorrowful because he knew that he had let down his Lord. Hey, Job went through testing and trials. The apostle Paul suffered imprisonment, hunger, sickness. All of the disciples, except possibly John, even though they believed John was possibly boiled in oil. Uh, all of the disciples suffered a martyr's death. Jesus was allowed to be tempted by Satan in the wilderness as well as being tortured and crucified. And the early Christians suffered persecution for their faith. And so I'm simply saying that if you are a believer, if you claim to be a believer in Christ, you're going to go through difficult times. The question is, what are you going to do when you go through difficult times? Now, if you're visiting with us today, you might be saying, uh, Pastor Polston, you're not really convincing me to come back, right? You're saying things might be hard. That's not what I expected. But I will tell you this. I'm going to tell you the truth. Hey, there's nothing like being a Christian. Anything that we receive in this life by way of heartache and heartbreak. We are blessed far beyond. And by the way, not just now, but man, God says that one day when we get to heaven, he's got something waiting for us that is, is completely beyond what our, our minds can understand. And so it's a blessing to be a Christian and God blesses us beyond anything that we could ever possibly deserve. And God promises that no matter what you're going through in this life, God says, I'm not going to keep you from going through everything. 
He says, but I am going to, I am going to be there with you in whatever you go through. I will be right there with you. And so Christianity is not a cakewalk. But I will say this, your tenacity to keep going with Christ, listen, even in your darkest hours will testify of your genuine faith. But you'll have to learn to surrender and rest in the knowledge that God is fighting for you. Amen? God is fighting for you. I was reading this story. I thought this was good. Um, young William Wilberforce was discouraged one night in the early 1790s after another defeat in his 10-year battle against the slave trade in England. Tired and frustrated, he opened his Bible and began to leaf through it. A small piece of paper fell out and fluttered to the floor. It was a letter written by John Wesley shortly before his death. Wilberforce read it again. Listen to this. This is powerful. He said, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Listen to this. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Isn't that good? Who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. Isn't that good? Go on in the name of God. What does the Bible say about persevering? 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Galatians 6 and verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Hebrews 10 and verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. James 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's all throughout the Bible. Persevere, persevere, persevere. Hey, listen, don't forget that by perseverance, the snail made it to the ark. Amen? I want to close with this. I thought this was good. This is a historical figure, and maybe you'll guess who it is before I get to the end. This man failed in business at the age of 22. He ran for the legislature and was defeated at the age of 23. He failed in business again at the age of 24. He was elected to the legislator at, uh, legislature at the age of 25. His sweetheart died when he was 26 years old. Listen to this. He had a nervous breakdown when he was 27 years old. He was defeated for the, um, for the uh, space of speaker at the age of 29. He was de defeated for elector at the age of 31. He was defeated for Congress at the age of 34. He was elected to Congress at the age of 37. He was defeated for Congress at the age of 39, defeated for Senate at the age of 46, defeated for the vice presidency at the age of 47, defeated for the Senate at the age of 49, elected president of the United States at the age of 51. Abraham Lincoln. That's exactly right. Defeat, 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 defeat. Why did God let him go through all those defeats? I'll tell you why. Because God needed someone to be the president who was going to do what was right. And in order for Abraham Lincoln to be that man of character, that man of integrity, to be the man that God needed him to be, 
God had to allow him to go through one trial after another, after another, after another, so that one day he could be exactly what God needed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what God does for us. Hey, if you're going through trials, and I love what James says, you know, uh, James served with God, well, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are gathered abroad, greetings. And then he says that when it comes to this idea of, of trials, that you should count it all joy when you fall into temptations and trials. Amen? Count it all joy. What are you talking about? That doesn't seem something to be joyful about. It would be if you knew what God was doing and why he was doing it. If you knew where God was leading and what he has in store for you in the future. And I'll just say this as well. How does a man go from having a nervous breakdown at the age of 27 to being elected president of the United States at the age of 51? I think... That, that one of the things is you've got to get to the place where you trust God with things. You see, one of the reasons we have that nervous breakdown is because we're trying to control everything. I got to control this. I got to control this. I got to do this. I got to, you know, and it's just not going to work if I'm not doing something. If I'm not touching it in some way, it's not going to work. It's all going to fall apart. I've got to be in control, 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 control. And sometimes God has to let us go through trials. And hey, listen, sometimes God has to put you flat on your back to show you that you're not in control, but he is. If you think that you have control, I promise you, you, you go, God lets you go through trials and you, you realize even during the times that you thought you were in control, you weren't. It's God that is at work in your life. It's God that is at work in my life. And hey, listen, even when you're going through trials, understand that there's a purpose in the trial. Where are you today with regards to making a decision for Christ? Would you say, Pastor Paul, I kind of have a wayside heart. I, I haven't been as interested as I should be. Maybe you've made an emotional decision in, in the past, put your faith to the test. You, you would say, I don't know that it would hold up. Maybe you're more concerned about the things of this world than the things of God. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I, I know I'm a Christian. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I, I remember when God worked in my life, I remember making that decision. And I can see throughout the, the weeks and the months and the years, I can see how God has worked in my life and how he has changed me. But, Pastor, I, I want to see my faith go to another level. Let's go to Lord in prayer.